So, um, so what I wanted to do was record this for Society for Participatory Medicine. Then they'll want to put it up as a one of their series. And I would like to change the subject from what they usually do. And they usually want people, they want to know what people think about the Society for Participatory Medicine. But I told them I wanted to open the can up a little bit and talk okay. to some people who are not members and get their point, point of view about things that are important. And we were specifically talking about the uh, characteristics of an ideal physician partner uh, that you, you and I were talking about. And I think that that's a very important subject, uh, which is, seems to be kind of neglected in most of our conversations. So I thought, since you have a lot of experience uh, as a provider and a patient, that it would be probably very helpful to get your, your point of view. So maybe it would be a good idea for you to just tell your professional story and then maybe a couple of minutes about whatever you feel comfortable s saying about your sure. personal story and then um, tell us what you think about physician partners and the kind, the kind that work for you and what you've seen work for other people. Glad to. Um, as you, I'm sure know, uh, probably the major factor in being an effective psychologist is being able to engage a person in a trusting relationship with you. So when I first meet somebody, that's my major goal: is to engage them in a relationship in which they feel. I'm interested, that I'm paying attention, that I'm concerned, that I'm empathic, that uh, I, I'm uh, eager to help them. All the factors that go into having them trust a person who wants to help them in some way or other. Right. Um, once you establish that relationship, then the diagnostic assessment and the treatment plan are going to be more valid, reliable and valid, because the material that you get from them is going to be more open and honest and, you know, accurate. Right. Okay. So that's, uh, that's my professional approach to that. Now you is been doing this for how many years? Oh, 43 years. Yeah, okay. 43 years. Mm -hmm. um, before I got my license as a psychologist, I was a clinical sociology more like 50 some years. Then I went back to get my PhD and became a psychologist. So, but as a psychologist, I've been doing it 43 years. Right. Um, what else do we talk about there? Well, professional stuff. I think that covers it in a nutshell. So your ca the characteristics from from your point of view, what about the patient? What does an ideal patient look like from your point of view? Hmm. I don't know if there is an ideal patient. Um, because the, uh, you know, they come from all stripes of life, all phases of life. And I think the, uh, that's one of the things that makes uh, professional life interesting, is that these are all different different people with different backgrounds, different issues, different needs, different ways of relating to them, uh, finding uh, a vocabulary that is uh, communicative for them, not, say, you know, not using the same vocabulary with everybody, finding a way that, uh, again, engages them in a way that they can communicate with me uh, so that I can understand what's going on with them and help them. So there's really no ideal patient other than somebody who I can 
facilitate to uh, to uh, trust me and talk with me about what's going on with them. So they need to be committed to the relationship, though. Well, ultimately, but I don't expect them to be committed when they walk in the door. Uh, as part of my job is to is to help them develop that commitment by who they see me to be. You know, just because I got the sign on the door and the diploma on the wall doesn't mean that they're going to think that I can help them. So it's really a process uh, that um, you go through to develop that trust and then hopefully they'll be committed to my being able to help them. So it's about trust. It's about trust. Okay. Any relationship really is based on trust, and particularly uh, a treatment relationship. Yeah, I think that's true in medicine as well. Right. So yeah. when you look at it's not. If, hmm? Go ahead. I suppose medicine can be more um, mechanical. If you go into a doctor because you got pain someplace, you know, uh, and he can relieve your pain, you don't have to have a close relationship with him like you would with a psychologist. If he relieves your pain, you trust him. If he doesn't relieve your pain, you don't trust him. You know, it's as easy as that, right? Um, I think the ongoing relationship with a medical doctor, I think, depends on many of the same things I talked about with uh, being a psychologist. You know? The two uh, people I think about when I think of uh, outstanding physicians are the surgeon I had at uh, Sloan Kettering and the uh, neuro-oncologist that Karen was at, uh, at Sloan Kettering. Those two people embody the qualities of a person who is modest and yet confident in their skills, but is humble in a way without being arrogant. A uh, person who really takes personal interest in the patient, who um, listens attentively to what you got to say and how you say it and what your concerns are and what your worries are and what your fears are. Not just the words, but the affect, emotional tone somebody who is not in a hurry, somebody who takes time to communicate with you that you are his main or his or her main focus right now, that he's not looking at his watch, but on to the next one, um, answers your questions uh, as thoroughly as he or she can, uh, is honest with you, Tells you what he can do, tells you what he's not sure about, tells you what uh, what you can expect as, as much as he can. You know, the, surgeon, the surgeon I had at Sloan, uh, I came to after having a very unpleasant experience with another surgeon at the, the cancer center who told me that my situation was very dire and very complicated and, uh, you know, she instilled in me a lot of doubt that she had about being able to help me. She didn't say those words, but I knew that she was really confident in what she could do for me. So when I got to the guy at Sloan, he told me that uh, it was complicated, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, that I would feel terrible for a period of time, but that I would survive in four months. And bing, bang, boom. Uh, he had a plan. Um, and uh, so, I mean, he, he delivered difficult information in a way that was very palatable and very hopeful. But he bullshit. You know, he was just giving me the straight scoop in a very kind way. A lot of people give you the straight scoop in, uh, in, a, in an objectified way. So you feel like uh, you're a lab rat. Yeah. When I got the first uh, 
diagnosis at Upstate. It was given to me, unfortunately, by a, a resident in urology. And uh, he was very blunt and officious and uh, cavalier. And uh, while I was stunned, I also wanted to punch him out. You know? I was stunned by his attitude, and I just was angry in response to his attitude. But uh, the guy who did the job in Sloan, he was the opposite of that. The opposite. And he's the, he's, he's the man, he's the guy, you know. So, so it's confidence, but not arrogance. Right. Uh, technical ability and right. humane. Right able to focus on your personal uh, problems right. and uh, deliver in a way that worked for you. Do you think that was tailored to you specifically or was it just that he is uh, extremely skilled and experienced? I think he's that way with probably everybody. Yeah, so, so it's a master at work. He was a master. As opposed to... And, and so was the young woman at uh, at Harrison. You know, as, as youthful as she might be, probably mid-30s, I, I would, she was a master at what she was doing. She was very um, compassionate without being syrupy. She was tuned in to the patient. She was... Uh, confident and competent. She was, uh, came up with the information that was requested. And if she didn't know what she could predict, she said that. Um, she was just a terrific woman, just a person that engaged you with terrific confidence. You know, you'd like to see her, that kind of quality in a a primary care doctor, you know, the, the, the qualities that she had, right. you know. And the other thing that I think we didn't talk about is that they, I don't know about your experience, but how much did they take as much time as you needed to answer all the questions and not rush out the door, uh, not spend time looking at the computer, things like that. I think those are the kinds of distractions that I see frequently, especially among young physicians, where they are uh, looking, literally looking at the computer and 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 playing, reading and playing with their notes instead of uh, having a conversation with the patient or family or both. So that was my that's one of my observations of of things not to do. But I don't know what, if this matches up with your personal experience or not. Very definitely. Um, when I met with Bachner at Sloan, he brought us into a conference room. When I first met him, he had gone over my my uh, information, my slides, and the whole thing. So he knew about me. Um, this was our first meeting with him, so it was brand new. Right. So he brings us into a conference room, and he... Uh, is in his shirt sleeves, and tie, shirt sleeves, and he reaches out his hand and says, Hi, I'm Bernie Bachner. No big Dr. Bachner, just kind of guy. And this is, the, this is the main man. This is the big, biggest guy in this country, probably. And this, uh, the, this area, and he met you at your level. No? He engaged you immediately with that. He disarmed you with that right away. So I would call that bonding. Did you have yep. instant instant bonding? It's like super glue. Very efficient. Very, I mean, not efficient. Very effective. Very effective bonding. Yeah. So yeah. All, all of a sudden, I like this guy. Right. Right. And he spent all the time we wanted. We asked him a lot of questions. We were probably with him three quarters of an hour anyway. Right. 
And he never looked at his watch that I can remember. And he just looked at us, nodded, paid attention, right. not distracted right. at all. Just a very uplifting visit for a very painful situation. And that, and that was a time for you to make a plans for a definitive treatment of, yep. of a new problem. Yeah, I walked away with a, with a detailed plan. And you were comfortable with that and confident. Yeah, I was. You know, it wasn't something I wanted to hear, but it was okay. You know, I was okay with the plan. Because right. I felt confidence in what he was saying. I've, I've noticed uh, a lot of people when they are hit with a uh, an unexpected diagnosis or something mm, drastic, they the immediate response is fear. So they stop thinking. I didn't feel that. Okay. I didn't feel that because I'd already had the diagnosis a month before and the diagnosing doctor sent me to him for treatment. So I, I knew the diagnosis and what I was getting from him was a consultation and what he rec run, what treatment he would recommend. And uh, so it was chemotherapy for three months and surgery and recovery for God knows four months he said to take for recovery. So, uh, you know, I mean, that was laid it up. So, but when, when I read, I didn't read the uh, surgery report for months after the fact. Right. I, I didn't want to. But when I read that, um, it was a lot more gruesome than I, I thought it was. Yeah. He, he acknowledged it. Uh, Report a very difficult surgical process for him. It was very challenging because of scar tissue and blah blah blah. Right. So I mean, he had a lot of work to do that he acknowledged in the report and in great detail. Of course, I guess that's how those reports are. Right. But uh, I had no awareness of that before the fact that that would be the case. Right. Which is probably just as well. <laughs> you know, he told me enough before the fact without telling me more than I needed to know. Right. right. But you didn't feel any uh, terror or fear that made it impossible for you to comprehend. No. I think it's no. common. Uh, it's, I think it's fairly common with uh, patients who have, who were hit with something out of the blue. Um, they, they, they get a stunned effect, sort of like a taser. Exactly. It's, it's, the, the, the cortex is not working. You know, you're operating in a, in, in a fear mode. And right. it makes it extremely difficult to get the messages across in a way that they're really understood. Uh, I wonder if you have any advice to other people about this. How did you deal with that? You didn't have that problem. He, he made me feel confident about it. That I, it's as simple as that. Uh, if if I were going under the knife in uh, Philadelphia, I would have been terrified. All right, so... Uh, it, it I was, it, you you essentially surrendered to this guy because you had confidence in him. That's right. So it was because you had faith and trust in this man that you were able to not have fear. That's right. And you were willing to accept the consequences, I, I guess, and the risks, uh, knowing that he was going to do the best he could do. And I didn't really expect that it would be uh, a negative outcome. I expected it would be a positive outcome eventually. And I, put a, I accepted his 
warning, if you will, that I would feel badly for a considerable period of time. Okay, and did it did it come out as as so he told you the truth, and and it, it was verified by your experience, I presume. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Yep. And you still have a, a complete confidence in him. Yep. Sure do. Yep. No. However, I, I did learn something um, fortunate, I guess, about the practice of urology. Okay? The urologist I have in Syracuse and even Sloan Kettering urologist never suggested that I see a nephrologist in order to protect my remaining kidney because with the history of kidney stones that I had what I learned from the nephrologist that if I get a kidney stone you know it could be over you know could, that could be the, the end so I went to see him on referral from my cardiologist not my urologist my cardiologist referred me to the nephrologist um, he put me on medication for anti-kidney stones and I haven't had one in over five years. Whereas, that was not the case before. So I don't know why urologists don't do that. I don't know why urologists don't tell their patients to do such and such to avoid getting kidney stones. So you got uh, good care for one uh, problem from the, surgical, from the surgical point of view. You got exactly right. what you needed. And you still got what, what I call disintegrated care, so that the rest of the care that you needed, you had to patch together from through two additional specialists. That's correct. So, that. and you really don't have any. So you still didn't have anyone coordinating your care except for yourself. That's correct. Yeah, we coordinated the coordinated the care. That's right. So that would be the only additional characteristic that might be valuable, I suppose. Is would be to have somebody quarterbacking the thing, right? Yeah, so you need the coach and offensive coordinator. Uh, right. And, and, and you had to do that for yourself, which is not bad, but it's a job, really, it's a physician's job. But if the primary provider doesn't take the time to do it, uh, then it, it falls on you, and that can be, you know, you might have bumbled through that for years, but you uh, lucked out and found, the cardiologist found the, the right nephrologist for you. Right. So. And I just went to the cardiologist for my annual checkup, maybe two or three weeks after I got home from surgery, yeah. and he said, you don't look so good. And so he put me in the hospital and put fluids in me and uh, called in a nephrologist to consult uh, for him about me. Right, right. So that was pretty cool on his part. That's what I was going to say. So that's unusual for, the, for an, a specialist to take on that responsibility. Yeah. Uh, he's obviously an unusual specialist. Yeah, he's a great guy. You know him. So he's a remarkable. He's a, he is a he would be one that you would call a uh, reliable physician partner. Yeah, Berkeley's a great guy. And um, so this is this is somebody who's one of your he's one of your team he's one of your primary team players, right? He is. He is. Yeah. Right. I only see him once a year, but he's he's there for me. That's great. So you can count on him. To help you coordinate your care, to help right. you find the the help you need. Yeah. And yeah. He, he intervened at that point and did more than he was expected to. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything else you would like to share with patients and physicians who are members of the Society of Participatory Medicine? Any other guidance 
from your point of view as a psychologist and patient, either or? Well, I think it's important, you know, I mean, I'm sure this is repeated many times, but I think it's important to treat people as a whole human being, you know, with issues in their life and family and worries and, you know, treat them as a person, not just as a kidney or, a, you know, a heart or, a, you know, an organ. You know, I think it's important to treat them and relate to them as a person who has issues that you are going to treat for him. And, um, and don't objectify him, you know. Relate to him as, as you'd want to be related to. Who was you? So treat, uh, yeah. treat the person, not the disease. And um, uh, treat the patient the way they wish to be treated. Exactly. Like the old golden rule, right? I, I, I suppose it, it basically is. I mean, it's fundamentally what we were taught when we when we actually took the Hippocratic Oath, in the days when we took the Hippocratic Oath and, uh, and pledged to do the right thing all the time. Um, uh, that's, that's what we were basically uh, pledging to do. So I think a lot of people have forgotten these rules. That's unfortunate, isn't it? Yeah. It's unfortunate. But I think we can uh, reinforce it. And is this? Uh, do you think there are ways for patients to deal with if they don't? What What should patients do when they don't find what they need? You know, when they don't find physicians who have those characteristics. Any ideas? Well, I think patients uh, feel vulnerable. There's an, an inequality of power in a patient-doctor relationship. Uh, so if the patient has a complaint. You know, complained about how he's being treated. The trade the physician will either fire him or take it out on him in some untoward way. Uh, so I think again, that's where sitting down with your sleeves rolled up and you know being at the same level as the patient, like Bachner did with us, uh, is how you earn that respect. You don't earn the respect by being more powerful than the patient, by uh, arrogance, by dismissing, you know, things that are extraneous in your mind if, as the physician. Extraneous, I want to hear about that, or that's not important, or that's irrelevant. Or you may not say it, but you, you say it in nonverbal ways. All right. Well, I think this is great. I think I think this is, is this will be appreciated by by many people. So um, I thank you for taking the time to do this with me. And pleasure. Uh, pleasure. Is there anything else you think we need to talk about related to this specific subject? If not, I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop recording. And we can continue to talk for a while. Uh, okay. Let me just get to my buttons here. Thanks again, Steve. Pleasure. Stephen Driscoll, psychologist, patient, many, many years experience. All right. <laughs>